All right, thank you, Kirby. When Kirby first uh, asked me to do this, he called me about a month ago, and uh, I, of course, I didn't know Kirby at that point, and somewhere in my notes, I had written down Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, instead of Kirby, and so there's a whole string of emails between Kirby and I where I start out with Kurt and uh, he replies politely with his signature Kirby. I'm sure he's over there going, Kirby! <laughs> so, so finally yesterday I noticed it and I apologized to him. So uh, a public apology, Kurt. <laughs> so, um, Admittedly, I didn't know too much about Austin marketing until um, just recently. And this morning, I actually went on the website and I got to watch the Walking on Sunshine music video. And I found myself sitting at my desk going, hey, this is pretty fun. And this must be a fun group of people. So congratulations, Kirby, for a good company, energetic, creative, and so forth. Um, uh, and for your benefit, I promise I won't dance today. Um, I, I am enjoying doing presentations like this uh, because now that I'm retired, uh, back in my career, anytime I do a presentation, it was usually to sell somebody on something, you know, uh, whether it's customers or, or employees or, or what have you on something. And um, now that I'm, I'm retired, I can do presentations like this, I'm not trying, I'm not selling anything. What I have done is kind of dedicated my my retirement time to helping small businesses grow. And in doing that, I sometimes find myself doing presentations showing kind of what we did as a company and all the mistakes that we made in the process so that hopefully you can, if you're running a company, you can learn a little bit from some of the mistakes that we made. So that's really what I'm gonna do today, is just kind of walk through a recap, a little story of Resource Systems, the company that Kirby just mentioned. Uh, my company, we were uh, down in New Concord. And, uh, and then towards the end, I'll be um, kind of concluding with a very important thing we learned in the last 10 years that we think made us grow so fast. As ten, last 10 years were the fastest growing, most healthy parts of, of our company's life. And hopefully there might be something in here that, that you can learn from if you're operating the company. So I think I'll, I'll just start with the whiteboard over here. I've got a timeline. It seems like a, the best way to do something like this. Um, Believe it or not, I was in college in the late 70s. Now, I know it's hard for you to believe, but we were, we were down at Muskingum College. Uh, a friend of mine, his name is Greg Adams, uh, met and um, we decided um, for a summer job, instead of getting a summer job, we, we somehow landed a contract with the Blue Drummer Restaurants. Anybody remember the... You remember the Blue Drummer restaurants? There are about 22 of them around southeastern Ohio. They're not in business anymore. But we landed a contract painting the lines on the parking lots. And so we spent half the summer in an old beat up pickup truck with a dilapidated compressor system that we developed, painting lines at night, and then we had camp during the day and we move on to the next one. And halfway through the summer, we completed that job. We went back to New Concord. And we heard that the maintenance and, and uh, grounds guys at Muskingum College were a little bit afraid of heights, and uh, they were supposed to paint the towers at the football field down there. And these are pretty good sized towers. And without climbing a single tower, we said, ah, we'll paint each one for $150. And they took us up on the deal right off the bat, which was probably our first clue to know that we underbid it. And it took us six and a half days to get the first tower done. We did the math and we figured out we made like $1.23 an hour on that job. And we also did the math and figured out it was going to take us till Thanksgiving to get all of them done. So we're just about ready to go to the maintenance guy and say, we can't finish this job. And I remembered that I was just learning how to uh, repel and mountain climb. So we got out the mountain climbing gear, the ropes and the harnesses, and we figured out a way to, to paint those towers. And by the last one, we did the last one in 12 hours. So we made, I think, $6.25 on, on that project. So it was time we went back to college. He was going into his junior year, I was going into the senior year, 
And um, I decided I was, I was going to apply at all the major um, uh, Ivy League schools for an MBA program. And I thought if I'd get you know, accepted, then I'd go, and if not, we would continue our business after graduation. Well, as you know, we continued our business after graduation. So back then, Muskingum College was the only place that had a computer. This is 1980, remember, you couldn't go out and just, you know, go to your Radio Shack or order online. So we, we um, Muskingum was doing data processing for a lot of the local businesses, okay? They knew it wasn't really their mission, but they were trying to help local businesses. And we thought, well, gee, if we make it our mission to do data processing, think how, you know, we could rule the world. And so we bought this, this big, day after graduation, we started this company, bought a great big computer, it's about the size of a refrigerator, and uh, I think it had 32 KB of memory, okay? And, and it had this disk drive that was 10 megabytes, okay? And we thought we were just, you know, we had died and gone to heaven. It took us about the summer to figure out how to operate this thing, and then he went back to college, and so it just left me trying to sell these, our services. And I didn't know anything about sales at the time, and so I made it my goal to call all the, the businesses in the Cambridge Yellow Pages. I couldn't call Zanesville because that was long distance. So by the time it came around to Christmas time, we didn't have any, we had no, no clients. And I think I had $11.52 left in the checking account and no business. Now, as a, as a little bit of an aside, back then, did you know that for $2, you could buy one of those jumbo-sized things of peanut butter and two loaves of bread. And do you have any idea how long you can survive on that? <laughs> we, we call those our peanut butter and jelly years because it went for seven years like that. Um, it took about two more months uh, until we first got our, our first client. And the way that came about is we decided to write letters to all the garbage haulers in southeastern Ohio, figuring, well, they've got all these bills they have to send out. So uh, a guy over in Newark called us in, a garbage hauler, and we went in, we acted like we had done garbage hauling billing for years, you know? And he surprised us and he signed up right on the spot. And so we're all excited and we're driving home, you know, we're high-fiving each other and we're all excited. And we, we got about halfway home, we go, okay, now, now just think a second, we've got to write all this software to do the billing and we've got to get 3,000 names and addresses entered into the computer, and then we've got to get them out. And the reason why he signed up so quickly is he needed it done in eight days. So, so we, we drank a lot of coffee, we did several all-nighters, but we got the job done. Now, some of you are going, oh my gosh, is he going to go month by month from today? <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to share with you what the first seven years were like, okay? Those were the peanut butter and jelly years for us, and all the advice we had gotten from everybody is that in order to be successful in business, you've got to specialize in something. So we determined that garbage hauling, garbage hauler billing would be our specialty. Well, over the next seven years, we were only able to get two or three more garbage haulers on our system. So we tried other things. We were able to land a couple other, we were able to land a couple doctors and do their billing. And we were able to land a couple fast foods. We did some payroll for them. And we did some mailing lists for some companies. But we could never land more than two or three at a time. And we got to the point when we'd go out on sales calls, most of the rejection was, well, you guys really don't specialize in our, in our industry. So we even got to the point where we made a little flyer that said, it was a fold open flyer, and it said, specialist in, and then it had a hole cut there, and then we would slip a piece of paper in there indicating what we were specialists in that day. And, you know, that didn't really get us too far. So, can anybody guess what our revenues were doing during those first seven years? This is the audience participation part. Thank you. Thank you. It's, they, it went pretty flat. If this is kind of representing, it was, that looks like it goes down, but it was pretty flat, okay? Now, somewhere about 1987, a nursing home in Zanesville called us and said, could you guys, we're having trouble 
tracking all the medical supplies that we use, the gauze pads, the syringes, all that stuff, because we've got to bill some of that, and of course we need it for inventory control. So we wrote some software for them to do that, and it used barcode readers to do it. And they liked it, and so we started writing letters to other nursing homes, and within nine months, we had landed a large account. Some of you might have heard of this company called Manor Care. Uh, at that time, they had 169 nursing homes throughout 13 states. So we kind of had our fingers crossed, maybe this is the specialty. And within a year after that, a, a big company called HCR with 122 nursing homes signed on. And then a number of other small nursing homes. So by 1990, we had about 400 nursing homes in about 18 states using this. So guess what our revenues started to do? Revenues were starting to climb, right? Because we were starting to specialize in something and we could replicate that expertise. So those revenues climbed and we continued to hire people and hire people and we had a number of programmers and, and customer support people on the staff and by 1995 we had about 1,500 nursing homes in about 30 states around the country using this product and we were, we were truly benefiting from specialization. Well then what happened is in 1997 there was a significant event in the nursing home world. The, um, the government decided to change the way, can you imagine this, the government decided to change the way they paid for nursing home services through Medicare and Medicaid. Prior to that time, they paid based on the cost, it was a cost-based system. And that's why it was important for nursing homes to track the supplies and so forth for cost purposes. But after that, it was what they called acuity-based meaning the acuity of the patient or the illness of the patient. So the nursing homes would assess the residents, the, the patients, and the government would pay them a certain amount. Well, what happened after that is after that event, 33% of the nursing homes in the country filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy because it was such a change in their business model. So. Any idea what our revenues did <laughs> after that? Our revenues were tied very closely. I mean, it was almost overnight. Our revenues dropped by half. Okay, And we were, we were found pretty much on our heels at that point. We had about 30 people on our staff. We were fortunate enough not to have to lay people off, but it did get, it did get a little bit tough. So, the next, the next five years were kind of interesting for us. It did level out and went kind of, kind of like this for the next five years. The first thing we did is we said, well, we need a new strategic plan, okay? And that's usually what companies do when they start thinking something's got to change. So we hired in a big consultant and we did a big strategic planning process bound up a great big, you know, fancy document and so forth, exactly what we were going to do. And 12 months later, that document was sitting in the bottom of one of my drawers with some rubber bands on it and old, you know, slide rules and tape measures. You know the drawer, the junk drawer. That's where that plan was. The next, the next thing we said, okay, what we need to do, we had heard some people say, what you have to do is measure the, the results and reward. Measure and reward. So we put together a big reward system for all of our employees. We had rewards at goals and rewards for each employee and then team or department based goals. And about a year from that, after that, we started realizing we were paying people rewards and the company was still successful, un unsuccessful. A good example is we had programmers and developers that were, that were getting rewarded for all the code, the, the programs they would write, new features that they would develop, but they weren't being sold. So they were getting rewarded and, we, and the company was still unsuccessful. And in, in addition to that, what we found is when you focused on giving a reward for one person or one team, what happens is people put their head down, 
They start focusing on that goal, and what do you think fails? It's the teamwork started to fail. They're saying, I'm busy now because I gotta get my goal. And, and the teams were doing that as well. So we started focusing on teamwork. And we did a big initiative. We did uh, uh, some teamwork building exercises, teamwork initiatives, uh, teamwork retreats and so forth. And a year later after that, we still weren't getting it. People were friendly, but we, we weren't getting any further along. Somewhere along this time frame, right about 03, 04, we heard about something called a balanced scorecard. And this is a little bit what I want, this is that, the start of what I wanted to tell you about, this balanced scorecard concept. It's fascinating. We heard about this concept and we implemented it right about at this point in time. And after that, and let me, I've got a slide here that kind of shows what happened as a result of that, we started seeing some changes in the organization. We started seeing cross-team opportunities emerging. And a great example, a great example of this, okay, we were a software company, okay? And so we had, we had motivated our support desk, you know, the hotline, the call you make when you have trouble with your software. All the people on that desk, we had motivated them to complete those calls as fast as they can. That's, that's, that's a good metric, and we were rewarding them on that. But what, we, what started emerging once we implemented the uh, balanced scorecard is somebody got the brilliant idea of, well, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have those calls in the first place? And it took the balanced scorecard to get the developers thinking about, why don't we go over to the support people and say, what's the most common phone calls you get? Because we'll design the system so we don't have those calls. So that was one thing that started emerging. Strategies, that strategy plan that I talked about, it started getting used and followed. The, the micromanagement, and yes, we were, my partner and I were accused of being micromanagers, uh, started disappearing. The, uh, uh, an attitude of continuous improvement started forming in the company, and we started seeing new energy towards the mission. So what happened after that is the company started becoming healthy in all arenas, in a balanced way, and this line, I'm sure you can probably start guessing, started climbing somewhere in this region. We actually landed the largest nursing home chain in the country. And then soon after that, the second largest and the fifth largest. And this line continued, continued up. We had about 28% annualized growth from this point until we sold the company in 2011. And we, uh, we had about 100 employees all down in, in New Concord, a few were distributed through the country. And we sold the company to Cerner Corporation, which is a, a large public company out in Kansas City that does IT for hospitals. So this period of time, this, this period of time to there, if I were ever to start another company, or run another company, the balance score, I'm a huge fan of the balance scorecard because it was so evident to us how that changed our organization. And I've got a little bit of, a little more facts about it here. It's neat because you can implement it yourself. If you're in business, you can do this. So here's kind of how it works. Um, back in the early 90s, some professors from Harvard did a giant study of all the super successful companies around the world. And they, they came back and they, they said, what is common among the super successful companies? And they determined that those companies have equal energy and attention and investment in four areas. Financial, operations, what they call learning and growth, and then, of course, their customers. What they also recognize is the not successful companies usually were deficient in one or two of those areas. Okay? Now, what was common among those companies is that they made it so it was visible that that um, desire to be balanced in all areas was visible to every one of the employees. So it wasn't just hidden at the top levels. 
Every employee knew about it, and most importantly, there were rewards in place to those employees if the company was holistically successful. So if you were in the operations area, let's say, and that area was successful, but the rest of the company wasn't successful, no reward, no bonus, okay? So guess what that started doing? Guess what that does for these companies? It gets people thinking like owners of the company. So here's, uh, here's a little bit what a balanced scorecard looks like. Um, it usually has four, those four areas, oh, see on the left there, customer, learning and growth, internal operations and financial, and there's usually four key metrics in each of those areas. So it makes about 16 key metrics. Now just to isolate in on this rep on one of them so I can show you how it works. So we've got, um, okay, here's one metric, a revenue metric. So the company decided that they wanted to be between 25 million and 28 million this year. So a low and a stretch goal. So this company ended up at 26.5 million. Half, exactly halfway between. Now this column is the points. So eight points are eligible if you get all the way to the goal. So they got halfway, so they get half the points. Okay? So the rest of the metrics work the same, it works the same way. They're, they're yellow if they're in the range between the low and the high. It's red if they don't make it. And it's green if they get over the, the stretch. And so what the, the important thing is not any one of these, but the important thing is this number down here. So this company decided that we want to be between a 20 and 30 this next year. And they ended up 23.38. So everybody in the company is rewarded proportionally for that number. If they had ended up at a, at a 19, no bonus. And if they ended up at a 30, the full bonus would be given. Now that's what, we, that's what we did here, and that's what most companies are doing that are using the balanced scorecard. And it was amazing to see the way the, the, uh, the company behaved differently. Some of the things that we saw for us is we were, prior to that, we were totally focused on the financial numbers. We were always focused on revenue and net profit and so forth, so we, we were heavily weighted on that. So it actually caused us to have less emphasis on that, which is ironic because that's when our numbers really started to grow. It, it caused us, the people in the company, to have more interest on continuous improvement. Okay? It caused employee development to occur in the learning and growth area because we weren't successful unless people were learning and growing. Okay? The, the, we wouldn't make the score if people weren't learning and growing. And in the customer area, it was interesting because we thought we were heavily focused on customers, but it caused us to start sincerely asking customers for their input and not just surveying our customers, which is, a, there's a big difference there. And some of the tangible reports, uh, results, I, I kind of hit this slide a little earlier, some of the soft results, it, it made life easier for everyone. It really did. Even though it was a heavy, heavy growth period of our company, life became actually easier. Customers received better, a better experience. What we liked about it is problems start getting solved down at the lower levels of the company. So you start seeing less micromanagement. My partner and I, it was actually the easiest part time of our company life because so many people within the organization were engaged in problem solving. We saw uh, decisions were made much easier because that balanced scorecard was really the strategy plan embodied. Uh, we saw more camaraderie and teamwork, and we saw a constant energy source taking place in the organization. So we're, we are huge, huge believers in the balanced scorecard, and the beauty of it, like I say, is you can any company can implement it. Uh, it doesn't take any special skills. We kind of learned it on our own. Um, 
And I mean, I'd be glad to answer any questions offline or right now, but that's, uh, that's pretty much the conclusion to, to my comments today. Does anybody have any questions? Anyone? The, uh, how did you determine what kind of, uh, you know, if, if, you met, if you met the range, say at 100% or at 2% or 50%, how did you decide the bonus? Was it a, was it a game sharing or a profit sharing? I'm glad you, people kind of refer to it as profit sharing. And the, the way we did it, we took about 2% of our profits and we put them in a pool. And for us, uh, towards the end, that was, that was like $250,000, $300,000, okay? And we decided up front that getting this scorecard to that number, it's worth two or $300,000 to do that. So that pool was there, and if we got halfway between the, you know, the low and the high, then the pool was cut in half and divided across all the employees. So, can you go back to your scorecard? Yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, the points and loss of points? Yeah. How did you come up with those? The, the uh, management team? Yeah, the management team came up with the weighting. Good, good question. The points possible, we kind of came up with how we wanted to weight that. And it's a, actually, it's a great question because depending on how we weight those is essentially us at the dials of the strategic plan. And there were some years where we were really, really pumping hard for new revenue. And then there were some years where we were really, really interested in new product revenue. So like this one, we put it at a 12. So that was, we were weighting that even higher. So that was where we had our input, but that's what was cool is it gave us a chance to drive the company to really stop. How did you, how did you resist temptation once you started becoming successful? <laughs> really pump those numbers out and really yeah. push your... Yeah. If, yeah, sometimes we, we did find ourselves stretching this beyond what, you know, our, the capacity was. And we heard from, we heard from our employees that's going to be a little bit too high to, to do it. So it was collaborative. Yeah. Great, great questions. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's really cool. Where we find yeah, I'd be glad to send an email to anybody. I could, you know, kind of shoot this. Well, I'll email that. Okay. And then you can dispense it out. Sure. Sure, that'd be great. Awesome. That'd be great. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good luck with the balance scorecard.